Hey everybody, I have a uh, special guest here. This is my old friend Charlie Shu. Charlie stopped by out of the blue today. Well, I knew he was coming yesterday. Charlie and I have been friends since. Tell the story, Charlie. Oh, what year was it, Rick? Do you know? Do you it remember was the year? 1989. 1989. He called me up when I was teaching at Ithaca College. Charlie yeah. called me. I actually came up to to meet with Steve Brown, who he did a video about. Yep. Right. And I, I asked Steve. We were standing over on one side of the the room. And I wanted a, uh, an upright bass lesson because I was just starting to play upright. I'd been a drummer for years, played some bass, but I was thinking, you know, I really want to learn how to play upright, jazz. And um, I'm talking to Steve, and he says, you know, I think there's somebody that's better for you. And I said, who's that? And he goes, he pointed across the room. Here's Rick with his hat, like sideways <laughs> like this, with a Jackson, I think it was a Jackson guitar. One of those. I never had a Jackson oh, guitar. It was a heavy metal with a like a... Axe. Was you know, it? Hey. I was probably playing one of my student guitars or something. Could be. Yeah. But you're talking to a student <laughs> and you're raking. You're going <laughs> like this. And I, I looked at you and I went, that guy? And he said, yeah, yeah, he's, he's good. You, you'll, you'll dig it. So I was, I was teaching one of my heavy metal, I think one of my heavy metal guitar students. They made us take students on that were not music majors. Mm -hmm. We had to take a few students each semester so to so that we would uh, incorporate students that were not music majors. Uh -huh. So I'd have people that were, you know, art majors and stuff, and then I'd get these guys with the pointy headstock guitars, and they'd come in and and they'd want to learn heavy metal stuff. And I remember that's how I first heard about bands like Nirvana. Uh -huh. Were from students that came in that wanted to learn songs, which I didn't know any of that stuff. I was just into, I was into like you know, rock, reggae, stuff like that, you know, but not not the heavy stuff. Yeah, but I wanted to learn upright. And then I, I looked at you, and I saw you raking. The thing that impressed me was you were raking on the guitar, playing all these rakey things, and you were taught, having a conversation with this guy the whole time. Yeah. So you were basically not paying any attention to what you were doing there. Yeah. So you came over, and you pulled out a book, and you said, okay, um, read, that, read that top line. And, of course, I knew nothing about reading. So I, I went like, C, C, D, D. Uh, e like that and and you you kind of want to try it again do it again so i tried it again you saw me struggling like a like a, anybody could struggle and then you said just play a blues and i said okay so you started you had your guitar you started playing we played a blues form for a little while and uh we got done i stopped and you said hey want to be in a band <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did I, jo I joined your band right after that that's right I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you. So Charlie is a fantastic drummer, bass player, and you have been um, involved in the technology side of things really since the beginning. So the first time that I ever saw anyone record anything digitally mm -hmm. was back in 1989. And you had, I remember coming over to your house, mm -hmm. and what would you have had back then? That probably was when I first got the Atari Falcon, which was like the, the mothership at that time. That was the best... Uh, recording system, and I think that uh, like Moby still has one, and you know, like there's only a couple that were made. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I met the guy. It was this French guy that took over the Atari company, and I was in Saudi Arabia playing with this guy Samite, this African that I've been playing with for many years. And I got on a boat in the Black Sea, and this guy got on. He's talking. It's like me and Samite and this other guy, and I'm talking to him, a French guy. He was there doing a uh, um, uh, he was doing a talk on robotics, in like. I don't know, this was 15 years ago or something. And um, I said, yeah, um, you know, he said, I have a company. I have a couple of companies. One of the companies I have is, you have you ever heard of it? Atari? I'm like, of course I've heard of Atari. I've had Atari since 1986. And I said, I have a Falcon. He went, you have a Falcon? And I said, yeah. He goes, there's only like, we only made like 50 or 100 of those things. Or maybe 1,000. I don't know what he said. But um, I still have it. I still have it. It's in a box. And was, it works. It works. I plugged it in, popped it up, everything's still So going. Charlie would invent things, too. So he invented, oh. 
The bass. You're oh gonna my God. talk about the bass. Charlie had this bass he made out of PVC <laughs> pipe. <laughs> yeah, it was two, two inch PVC pipe and it came down to a to an elbow <laughs> and then I put the strings through it, drilled holes, and you and you and Alan came over. I started playing and I said, Well, it's kinda it's kinda bendy, you know, because it like it But would, it was an upright bass and it sounded yeah. like a real upright bass. Yeah, I stuck piezos on the side, I shaved it down, stuck yeah, it was I Okay, liked but when like get, let's get back to the to the the computer thing what, what was how would you record stuff then what 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 software were you using oh it was cubase it, it was cubase yeah the original cubase well there's cubase atari falcon and okay. there's cubase that was regular for an atari i had no idea that that company went back that far yeah, yeah. this is like the first digital recording steinberg stuff. was the kind of the flagship for Atari, they they were doing all kinds of stuff, and as a matter of fact, I have all these parts for that Atari that I never put in, like uh, memory upgrades, and and I have this uh, digital interface from the time okay. that would sit on top of it. That so that was it. Their own proprietary no, thing that they oh, had. Steinberg. It was Steinberg. Okay. Actual Steinberg. Okay, so products. how big? What was the memory like on the computers then? Like five megs or something? Memory? Some some ridiculous um, right? low amount. Yeah, yeah, it was like nothing. Why would you ever need any more? You exactly. know, it was one of those kind of things. Well, I was working for Glyph Technologies, which probably some of your your audience knows yeah. who that is. Uh, yeah. Glyph was doing... They started there, in Ithaca, right? Yeah, started in Ithaca, and um, it was 95, 1995 when I started with them. There was only three of us that started the thing. And I remember somebody sold a half gig... Uh, which was like, oh my god! They were on top of the thing. Going, I sold a half gig, you know, like it was it was this huge, a half gig, a half gig hard drive. Yeah, it was like that was the biggest <laughs> thing going. Yeah, that's insane. But that was where it was going. Yeah, and we were we were um, providing. You made all the hard drives that people used in the recording studios. Yeah, when I was when I started in '99, producing yeah. full time. You'd see the glyph buy, drives were in all the recording buy a studios. That's what people would say, right? Like, let's buy a glyph. We'll, we'll record on that. Yeah, and um, because the real thing for that company was overnight replacement. Yeah, which was which was kind of the holy grail. There were there were two. There was Pacific Coast Technologies out in California. And there was another one in the Midwest, I forget the name, but uh, one of them came up with overnight replacement. So we had to do it. Were you doing um, any type of website stuff too? As a matter of fact, the first, Glyph wanted to do a website yeah. in 96, probably 95, 96. Yeah. And this was when Windows 95 came out. Yeah. You know, it was like, we're talking the early days. Yeah. And they wanted to get a company from Louisiana. To do from New Orleans to yeah. do the website, and they quoted like twenty grand or something, and I said, "I'll do it." You know, so I just went. I went out and I went on the internet at that time, which was mostly all just uh, bulletin boards. Right. Remember that? Yes. Bulletin boards. It was all text. Yes. So it was just people typing in, bunch of nerds. You know, for, for, and mostly it was uh, university bulletin boards. So I went on there and I, I started looking. I said, "How do you do a website?" And it was. Um, I can't remember the thing. front page was a software. Okay. So I just learned front page, and, and I, that would be HTML or something back then, or, or was it precursor no, it was, to that? It was precursor. It was it was HTML, but I didn't want to go in, in that whole like rabbit hole of, yeah. of getting down into like learning the code. It was it was the first YC wig, you know, what you see is what you get editor. So I just I just slapped a bunch of pictures. Charlie, in. the first time I ever saw the internet was over at your house, yeah. over at your studio. Exactly. I was like, well, what was, is that? That was the that was the time I was working on that stuff. So so Rick was playing with me in a band, um, playing guitar, and uh, we were doing some singing too. I think yeah. we were both of us. But I would go over to your studio and uh, separate from that, and you would you had drum pads that you would w do stuff on. Are you talking about at the trailer park? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or no, it was in Dryden. Was it, it was uh, in Dryden. Dryden. That's right. Yeah, That's right. At, at my grandparents' house. Yeah. Which was on the side street there. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, you come. It was in the back. There was a little little shack yes. in the back that I had covered with. Um, I I had um, insulated it and put uh, sheetrock and then rug, so that it was yes. somewhat. Yeah. Old, old, school, old school, old school, old school diffusion. Yeah. old school. And I had a bunch of you know like old furniture and crap, and it was hardly any room in there. I mean, yeah. you basically walked in like this. You yeah. know, I sat down and uh, I'd hand you a guitar. And yeah, two people. About, and about and it. I would use the I would use the Atari Falcon and yeah. record, and and I was hooked up to the internet, dial up. Unbelievable. You know, you know. So it was that whole thing. 
And um, yeah, I was, I was toying with the internet because that was the reason to do it, was to work at my job, which for the first year and a half, two years of working there, I didn't make any money. You know, there was no money. Right. We were, we were building the, and that was one of the things about that time, was that you tried to make it seem like you were a big company, even though you were only three guys, you had no money, nobody was right. getting paid, right? But you, if somebody called up, oh, yeah, we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get that drive up to but you, did no you problem. Guys, you guys really specialized, though, uh, as far as I know, when I first heard of Glyph, was really in related to music. Yeah. Well, it was, it was um, the guy who started it, this guy, Steve Gorney, was out in, he was working for Chinon, which was a, um, a Japanese company, and they, made, they did... Um, CD, CD ROM drives. Yeah. Right? And it was, you know who it was? Who's that? Check this out. It was Andy Summers Tech. Okay. That was looking for a way to get samples into a device he was using. How about that? Of course. I just, it just remember that. So it was Andy Summers Tech that got a hold of Steve Gorney and said, People tell me that you know this stuff mm -hmm. because he was a he was a wannabe musician. You know, he was he played some guitar, he sang a little bit, but he never played out or anything like that. But he he loved the technology. He was a Todd Rundgren freak. Okay, he was totally into Todd. Thought Todd was God. You know that, Todd that was whole God, thing. Yeah. And uh, so so he got he got a hold of Steve and and Steve said, well, here's what you need. You need these cables. You need this thing. You need this drive. Blah blah blah. And his tech said to him. Well, I've called everybody, and nobody knows anything about this stuff. You should start a company. And he, the light bulb went off, and he said, wow, okay, you should so, start a company. He was in California. Okay, wait. I, I need to backtrack here because I just realized another person that was in Ithaca at the time, and this was MIDI stuff, and composer, performer was Doug Wyatt. Oh, yeah, who ended up working for Apple, and I think he's still there. He was, I think he was at OptCode first yes. and then went to Apple. Yes. Okay, he, so, he so this is He wrote a lot of in, the GarageBand stuff and all the Logic stuff. He worked on all that, all that. Okay, so this was in '87. I met Doug, and yep. he did, and and did we, we do a gig with him. I think we did. I think we did. And yeah. but he had an SE computer, a Mac SE yep. that he worked off of. And he this is the first time I saw performer composer, which became um, Mark of the Unicorn. Mark of the Unicorn, became which became perform what well, performer? Performer, digital, digital, digital performer. performer. Yeah. yeah. So all this stuff was happening, and I used I used to record stuff, MIDI stuff. Mm -hmm. Back because we had a, a one in the Ithaca College uh, faculty lounge had a computer there, and no one used it because none of the faculty members in 1987 knew how to use a computer. Of course. So I went in there and put in the 3.5 floppy. It was the wild, wild west. It was. In terms of anybody knowing what the hell was going on with this stuff. So how did I end up going from being a jazz guitar player and everything to working on computers all the time it and, my fault. and doing this. It's, it's your fault, fault, Charlie. Yes. I started you up. I was fa always fascinated by this stuff, by how computers work. Yeah, me too. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is that there are a lot of people who are, who are kind of grappling with, you know, being a musician as opposed to, like, the gear and thinking about... And I'll, you can see it on a million YouTube videos now about people, like, they're... they're, they're um, demonstrating how to use software or they're doing that and you know you can really get lost in this for hours and you really should make music you know like everybody's saying like get back to the music and one of the things that um i've noticed from engineers over the years and you you might know this as well for yourself close your eyes right mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at the screen yeah. all day and you're thinking about how to move things around how to cut and paste and all of a sudden yeah close your eyes and use these yes. you know like just stop. I'm a big I'm a big advocate of that of of don't look at the screen use your ears yeah like walk away from the screen yeah. stand over there listen to it from another vantage point I think one of the things from the from your uh, interview with Andy was Andy Summers was he was talking about um you know the the pedals and and the stuff that he was into and and that you know he was talking to some guy and they were like hey what pedal are you using what's the, what's the setting and he's like Dude, you you know you should be learning to play. You know, like don't be stuck in that. Yeah. You know, and I totally agree. Like that's that's been kind of the bane of the existence of people like myself who are into the technology and saw like for instance, let's let's just go back even further. Drum machine, Lindrum. Yeah. Yep. I was working in in Boston at uh, Soundtrack, 
right, with, with a bunch of different people, a guy from the Cars, you know, uh, somebody was just talking about this band the other day, uh, Mission of Burma, you remember them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would come in, all that stuff. So somebody walked in with this, with this, with a drumulator, right? And they drumulator, yeah, of yeah. course. They brought it in, they set it up, they plugged it in, they hit a couple of buttons, and a drum, a drum pattern started playing. Yeah. And I'm a drummer, and I was playing in the studio. I was the first call drummer at, at Soundtrack for a while, doing, yeah. like, McDonald's commercials, and I uh, actually... Uh, Roy Buchanan's guy called me at three in the morning and said, Roy, Roy's doing a session. Come on down. You know, and I was like, it's three in the morning, bro. And he said, that's when he likes to play. You know, so I went down. So there was a lot of stuff going on at that time, right? So being a drummer that was being called in to, do, to actually uh, replace the parts, right? Because yeah. the drum sounds sucked. Yeah. So they, they, they lay down the pattern, and then you, they call you up, and you come in, and you have to play lock, lock time. Yeah. And just replace, replace the sounds, and they'd yeah. use your part. So after a while, I started realizing, well, I got to get into this. I got to learn how to program it. You know what I mean? And the drummers who did that got work because you programmed it. You worked with the worked with the songwriter to get the, to get the pattern they wanted, print it down, and then come back and replace it as the drummer. Right. Right. So you get paid twice. Right. right? Instead of just coming in. And, nice, Charlie. Pretty smart. Well, you know. I mean, you see these things coming ahead of you, and you go. What's going to happen to my career? What's yeah. going to happen to what I'm doing with my life? If if all of a sudden this machine and now we got AI, which we could talk about that. And yeah, yeah I know you've been dealing with that up and up with the uh, the big suits up there in <laughs> DC. <Charlie. laughs> big, big suits, the big suits. <laughs> I want to have you come back, and we're going to make a video with you. Charlie's a phenomenal musician, incredible drummer, incredible bass player. I want you to come back and play on a video with me. Will you do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. Charlie just moved to Asheville, mm -hmm. he's down visiting, and uh, I've I've been telling him he needs to come on the channel for years. 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 And I'm glad I finally came down. So, Charlie, you're the man. Great seeing you today. Thanks for coming. Yeah, my pleasure. I will come back. It's a threat. <laughs> threat taken. <laughs>